So, welcome back. In the previous session, we were discussing about uh, time series analysis and uh, we discussed one of the simplest method of time series that is the moving average methods. We discussed two methods of moving average, the simple moving average method and the weighted moving average method. Then we also discussed that uh, limitations of these moving average methods are responsible for their limited application into the real field of demand forecasting. So, we have improved method which is known as exponential smoothing method. We also discussed in our previous session different types of models incorporating various types of trends and various types of seasonality component into the demand data. And now, we will move further to see how we can use the exponential smoothing method for those different type of components in our demand data. For an example, we have this sample data with us and uh, we will go with the method of exponential smoothing for this sample data. Now, to understand the basic exponential smoothing method where we have only horizontal component in our demand data and there is no other component in the demand data. So, what is happening actually we are right now in the month of January and February is approaching. In the month of January, we have some level or you can say the forecasted demand and on the basis of that forecast, you are doing the forecast for the February. Now, in the forecast of February, there will be some errors and the actual demand will be dt. Now, on the basis of this actual demand of for February, we will determine the level of February and this level of February is the forecast of March. So, this is how this system will work. Now, it is up to us that how much uncertainties, how much variation of a particular period we want to include in getting the forecast for the next period. And therefore, if we see that there are certain changes in the external environment which are of permanent nature, we will incorporate more deviations into our forecast. And if we see that there are certain temporary changes in the forecast, then we will not incorporate those changes into the forecasting model. And therefore, this exponential smoothing method gives us that flexibility that how much variations you want to include into the forecasting method. Actually, as we have discussed in last two sessions that we have two components of the forecast one is level and another is the random variation. So, in the basic exponential method, we are only interested in determining the level component and the random component cannot be determined by our mathematical model. So, whatever is the level of the current period, that is actually the forecast for the next period. So, in the basic exponential method, as I mentioned that the level of February is the forecast of the March. So, if I say, if I represent label Y S T, the current label I am representing by S T. So, this current label is actually the forecast for the next period. This is the forecast for the next period. So, now, how do we determine the current label? That is the issue because if I determine the current label, that is the forecast for the next period. Now, the current label actually 
when I am taking this exponential smoothing method. So, what I am trying to do that I will take into account some of the fluctuations of my the demand and for that purpose this is the current level and therefore, S t minus 1 represents the previous base previous level and some of the fluctuation of my current period I will like to incorporate and if this is the new demand minus old base. This becomes my expression to calculate my updated base value or which I can also write as alpha into d t minus s t minus 1 s t minus 1 or you can write it as alpha d t plus 1 minus alpha into s t minus 1. So, this becomes the expression for my new base and now let us see that how do we use this for our this type of data this data is there and let us try to use this formula on this data. Here we have a data of actual demand for the first quarter of 2017 as 41,000. So, my current DT is 41,000. The forecast I am assuming, the forecast I am assuming for this period when I was in the fourth quarter of 2016, I did a forecast of 40,000 for the first quarter of 2017. So, let us say my S t minus 1 is 40,000. So, now if I determine, if I determine the base for this period, if I determine the base for this period, if I determine the S 1 2017, that is actually the forecast for second quarter of 2017. And please be sure that I am not taking into consideration any kind of trend seasonality in this data, though this data exhibits some kind of seasonality. But for the sake of example, I am just not considering that seasonality into this data right now. So, now I am determining S 12017 which is if I go by this expression is alpha into d t, d t is d of first of 2017 plus 1 minus alpha into s t minus 1 that s of 4th of 2016. So, if I go with this expression, I can calculate S1 2017 and S1 2017 is nothing but forecast for the second period of 2017. So, I get the forecast of second quarter of 2017 using this method. Now, here the importance is of what should be the value of this alpha, what should be the value of this alpha. Theoretically speaking, the value of alpha can lie between 0 to 1, value of alpha can lie between 0 to 1, but practically the common values of alpha which we use are from 0.05 to 0 0.30. These are the common values of alpha 0.05 to 0 0.30, but it can be 0 or it can be 1 also. Now, the meaning of taking different values of alpha. Let us say if I take alpha equals to 0.1, if I take alpha equals to 0.1, what does it mean? If I take alpha equals to 0.1, the meaning of his, this alpha is that I am taking only 10 percent, I am taking only 10 percent of my current demand, 
I am taking only 10 percent of my current demand and I am discounting 90 percent deviations. I am discounting 90 percent deviations and I am taking 90 percent of my previous base. So, that is the meaning of alpha equals to 0.1. This means that smaller values of alpha, this also means that smaller values of alpha has more smoothening effect. If you have a smaller value of alpha, it gives you more smoothening effect and larger values of alpha, larger values of alpha should only be taken in that case when you have a shifting base, when you feel that there is a change which is of permanent nature and you want to include that change in your forecasting model, then you should go for higher values of alpha. For an example, as we have discussed in previous session also, that when a new pay commission is coming and purchasing power of people are increasing. So, this is a permanent kind of change and as a result of that permanent change in your purchasing power, your value of alpha may permanently shift. So, in that case you can go for higher values of alpha and when you take lower values of alpha, you are having more smoothing effect. Now, if you take for an example two extreme cases, you take two extreme cases when alpha equals to 0 and alpha equals to 1. So, if you substitute in this equation, in this case when alpha equals to 0, so it means your current base is equals to old base. The meaning is that you do not want to include any deviation of the current period into your current base. <coughs> like the issue of smog during October and November in NCR area, that is a temporary type of phenomena. So, because of that, whatever fluctuations in demand has taken place, you do not want to include that fluctuations permanently into your model and as a result of that, you will take very small values of alpha and maybe you can take alpha equals to 0 in some cases. Then alpha equals to 1, this will lead alpha equals to 1 will lead to st equals to dt. Now, st equals to dt in this particular case, you see that you have totally shifted your base. You have taken a new base, the new demand is your new base. So, you do not want to take your old base at all into your consideration. So, it is a jumping base type of scenario and uh, maybe in case of uh, pay commissions, maybe in case of uh, rehabilitations, large level of re rehabilitations or something of that sort whenever happens. So, you can have a very high value of alpha. So, these are the extreme cases, but normally alpha lies, normally alpha lies between 0 0.05 to 0.30. So, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.15, these are very popular values of alpha. And on the basis of that, you can do this calculation and you can get the new base for this period of uh, first quarter of 2017 and that will automatically become the forecast for the next period. So, this is our simple method of basic exponential method. Now, as we discussed in the case of moving average method, for better forecast, you need to have long historical data. Now, that requirement is reduced here. You only need data, you do not require this long data with you. You only require data of just last two periods and that current data helps you in getting the forecast. So, you are getting forecast with less data and which is more accurate, which is more adaptive, which is more you can say customized as per the situation whichever is happening in the market. Now, once we have understood the simplest form of exponential smoothing method, now we will go to some different form of exponential smoothing method where we will see that how you can customize your model to suit the requirements of trend and seasonality component into the demand data. And here we are using only single smoothing constant alpha 
in those cases we may use more than one smoothing constant because this smoothing constant is only smoothing the fluctuations of your label data. But when you have trend, so you require one smoothing constant to smoothen the fluctuations of your base data and one to smoothen the fluctuations of your trend data. When you have seasonality into your demand data, then you require one smoothing constant to smoothen the fluctuations of your seasonality component also. So, depending upon the type of characteristics of your demand data, you will require as many number of smoothing constant. So, now, now let us move to the second type of smoothing method where we will have the trend also in our data. Now, trend can also be of two types trend can also be of two types one is linear trend or additive trend and the second is ratio trend or multiplicative trend these are the two types of trends which are possible the meaning i show you if i have the historical data with me in that case you can see this for this is period, this is column A, this is column B and let me have the data for some past periods. Now, here I am starting with 20, 22, 26, 27, 29, 31 like that and in this case we have 20, 24, 29, 34, 39, 44. So, you will see that in both these cases you have a trend, but here in the first case here the demand is increased by 2 units, then by 4, then by 1, by 2, by 2. So, you are having a kind of additive some constant figure or a fluctuating figure is being added into the demand of previous period. So, it is more like a linear trend, some almost constant thing is being added. Here demand increased by 4, then 5, then 5, then 5, then again 5. So, here the demand is increased in a more ratio type of field that uh, it is multiplying to the previous periods. So, finally, from 20 to 44, it has just doubled. So, that is a kind of ratio you are getting over a period of time. So, it is multiplying effect and here it is additive effect. So, depending upon what type of trend you have, you can suit, uh, make changes in your uh, model which we are going to discuss. Now, going further into the calculation part of this, since we have in our component trend also and already that linear part is very much present. So, to solve such type of cases, let us see if I take the first data with us, if I take the first data with us. So, you have this trend component, initially there is no trend and then you have a trend of plus 2, plus 4, you have plus 1, plus 2 and you have again plus 2. So, these are the trend data which you have. When we are developing the forecast in this particular case, so now the F2107 will be the updated base of the current period that is S12017 plus the updated trend of current period that will make the forecast for the next period. So, I need to make updated base for the current period and I have to make the updated trend of the current period and when I add both these things I will get the forecast for the next period. So, if I generalize this relationship, so I will say that F T 1 is nothing but S T plus 
TT that is the forecast for the next period is the updated base for the current period and the updated trend for the current period. Sometime it is possible that in case of trend data I will like to forecast for 2, 3 periods ahead from the current period. So, in that case if I want to forecast for m period ahead. So, in that case this value of trend is considered as a constant value and then I will do like this. I am taking a particular case of linear trend that is why I am just adding up these things. If it is uh, a ratio trend then the multiplying effect will come into picture accordingly. Now, let us see how do we do that. So, first we need to calculate the updated base and then with the help of updated base we will determine the updated trend also. So, the updated base S t we already know how do we determine the alpha d t plus 1 minus alpha s t minus 1 that is in the simple exponential method. Now, with the trend it will become alpha d t plus 1 minus alpha into s t minus 1 plus t t minus 1 that is the previous forecast and that is the current demand. And now, I also need to do the updation in the trend data and for that purpose I need to calculate the T t and T t is nothing but the difference of my current base and the previous base. So, T t is S t minus S t minus 1 and this is beta plus 1 minus beta because I am taking the second coefficient of a smooth ring as beta which is for the trend purpose 1 minus beta into T t minus 1. So, this is the updated trend value and then finally, the forecast F t 1 will be S t plus T t. So, this is how we will do the forecast when trend is available. The calculation of linear trend the additive trend is done as S t minus S t minus 1 and if it is to be multiple trend if it is to be ratio trend it will be S t upon S t minus 1. Please be careful that if it is a ratio trend it will be S t upon S t minus 1 and since I am considering the case of linear trend it is S t minus S t minus 1 and this is the old trend and then I update the S t plus T t and I get the forecast for the next period. And if I want to use this trend value for getting the forecast for 2, 3, 4 periods ahead then this expression will work F S t plus M t and now this model is ready and now I can use this model for getting my values for the next period. Here as I discuss about alpha the same discussion will apply for the beta also. The values of beta also varies between 0 to 1. The popular values of beta are from 0 0.05 to 0 0.20 because the fluctuations in trend are not much. So, we use lesser values of beta and we want to discount maximum fluctuations of uh, trend values and uh, it is very rare it is very rare that you use very extreme values of beta. So, normally beta values are less than alpha values, but uh, since both these are the smooth ring constants. So, academically theoretically their values can vary from 0 to 1. So, beta can also have 0 to 1, but uh, the popular values are from 0 0.05 to 0 0.20. So, now if I apply this equation these two equations on this piece of data 
So, you can see that uh, for the 7th period for F7, I need to apply S6 plus T6. I need to calculate S6 and T6 and with the help of S6 and T6, I can directly get the value of F7 and S6 will come from this equation for S6 I require S5 and for T6 I require T5 and when I use this expression I can directly get the values of my required uh, uh, forecast for the next period. Then in case of ratio the only thing which I just told you this value will change this will become st upon st minus 1 in case of ratio this calculation will change to st into tt and this calculation will also change to st minus 1 into tt minus 1 rest of the model will remain as it is there will not be any change in any other component of this model. So, with this you can handle both these types of trend, you can handle the linear trend, you can handle the ratio trend. But now, just by seeing nobody can give you the answer whether <coughs> this A has linear trend or whether B has this linear trend. You may think in your mind that how do you can say that here you have 20 to 31, you can have a ratio of 1.5 something like that. Here you are moving from 20 to 44, you have a ratio of somewhere around 2.2. So, why cannot we apply a ratio model in this case or why cannot we apply a linear model in the second case? Because each time 24 to 29, 29 to 34, 34 to 39, 39 to 44, demand is increasing by a very constant value 5. So, why cannot we apply a linear model in second case and why cannot we apply a ratio model in the first case? Practically speaking, theoretically speaking, I do not have any answer for that. Only my model will tell the answer, only my model will tell the answer. Model means whether I am calculating forecast using st minus st minus 1 or st upon st minus 1 and after determining the forecast I will calculate the forecasting errors and whichever model whichever model will give me minimum forecasting errors whichever model will give me minimum forecasting error that is the suitable model for my particular case. So, now our next topic of discussion is the forecasting error so that we can understand the meaning of selection of different types of model. Without understanding the forecasting error, it is almost impossible to select the right kind of model because once you select the model, the appropriateness of that model will also depend on proper selection of values of alpha and beta. So, all these things are very much you can say in a family the kind of model, the selection of values of alpha and beta and these models should produce minimum forecasting error. So, in our next class we will discuss more about forecasting error and then we also will take a case of third type of component that is the seasonal component in our demand data and how to handle that seasonal component in the demand data. So, that case will also take and this data will be useful in that case also that because here you can see we have this seasonality in our demand data present. So, how to handle the seasonal component in the demand data and then we can move to the most complex case where we have the seasonality as well as trend both these things in our demand data. So, how to handle such type of cases that we will see in our next lecture. Thank you very much.